Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third day of the 76th Annual League of American Orchestras Conference. I'm Laura Reynolds, Executive Director of the Boise Phil, and I'll be your MC today as we explore our theme, Better Together. This week, we've heard wise words from Wynton Marcellus to speak about the responsibilities we have as orchestra leaders. And yesterday, we explored our new relationships with technology. Today, we're going to think deeply and share strategies around building relationships with our local communities. Before we get started with today's session, on behalf of the League, I want to gratefully acknowledge our sponsor for today's session, Fisher Dax Associates. The consultants at Fisher Dax have a great appreciation for and sophisticated understanding of concert halls with over 50 completed venues for symphonies worldwide. FDA looks forward to the opportunity to meet you in person and to hear live music again. Thank you to Fisher Dax for their support, and we urge you to go and visit them and all of the other sponsors and exhibitors who have set up shop in the virtual exhibit hall. So what does it mean to be an orchestra? More importantly, what could it mean to be an orchestra? Together with our community, Orchestras have more power and potential to shape the future of our society than ever before. After over a year of living with the coronavirus pandemic, a large scale reckoning with racial injustice, the climate crisis and economic uncertainty, the importance of learning about, connecting deeply with and trusting our communities couldn't be more urgent or possibly more complex. I believe an orchestra's purpose is to be in service to its community through art. That means everything from curating stories that are meaningful to the specific place where you live, which is why we need orchestras in every single corner of this country, but also to share those stories outside of the concert hall and the places that we all actually live, work, and play. It means moving community engagement from a siloed department into the DNA of our institutions and to witness how we can uniquely embrace the broad range of human experience. It also means that we have the responsibility to act, to engage, and to no longer be bystanders in our society. Musicians, administrators, board members, we are all part of this world, and if we have learned anything this year, it is that we are part of an ecosystem that requires us to care for, empathize with, and support one another. Today's keynote, panel, and facilitated chats will be our opportunity as a field to explore these big questions and dive deeply into the strategies and tools that we need to take action. With that, let me introduce our keynote speaker, Mark Bamuti-Joseph. Bamuti currently serves as the Vice President and Artistic Director of Social Impact at the Kennedy Center. He co-founded the Life is Living Festival for Youth Speaks and created the installation Black Joy in the Hour of Chaos for Creative Time. His opera libretto, We Shall Not Be Moved, was named one of 2017's best classical music performances by the New York Times, and his work Pelota toured nationally. Future projects include commissions for the Parliament Center, Washington National Opera, and the Albany Symphony Orchestra, as well as a featured performance in HBO's adaptation of Between the World and Me by Ta-Nehisi Coates. An inaugural recipient of the Guggenheim Social Practice Initiative, Bamuti also previously worked as the Chief of Program and Pedagogy at YBCA in San Francisco. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mark Bamuti Joseph. Hey family, hope everybody is doing well. It is uh, literally an honor to be with you today. I'm so excited. I've been excited to um, engage with you all for some time. Thank you to Simon Woods for um, inviting me. Um, yeah, so uh, I am here in unceded Piscataway and Anacostian territory, uh, what is um, conventionally known as Washington, D.C., the capital of uh, this great country. Um, uh, I am a man of Haitian descent with chocolate brown skin, um, a bald head, and a full beard that 
is mostly black except all the hair on my chin, which is gray. Uh, I'm wearing glasses and a pink button-down shirt. I'm standing in a well-lit room facing east. I'm standing in front of my kitchen, which has flowers hanging from the ceiling, and my living room, which has large format photographs mounted on the uh, crimson painted wall um, behind me. Um, I'm going to share my screen. We've gotten so good at doing this uh, in this time. Um, great. So before I worked at the Kennedy Center as a vice president, I worked there as a commissioned artist. This is me in the Kennedy Center's uh, Terrace Theater in 2009, performing a show called The Breaks. Um, my body, doesn't really do stuff like this anymore. Um, so I'd like to think how I administer is how I do this. Um, I'd like to think that the way I administer is clean, is gyroscopic, it's dynamic. The Kennedy Center has commissioned four evening length works of mine since 2009. Um, and that is really where we begin. My relationship with my institution is born out of artistic belief. But I think I got the gig because while I was performing on stage, I was organizing communities off stage around issues ranging from environment to immigration, using my art as a lever to include folks who historically had been segregated out of the institutional experience. What you're looking at is a still from a social practice module that I first made through a commission from the Guggenheim Museum called Moving and Passing. We were in a heightened moment of xenophobia, uh, a moment of assault on immigrant identity in the United States. And I wanted to think through how soccer could serve as an affirmational tool for first generation Americans and immigrant kids um, to also consider movement patterns on the field as kin to migratory patterns across social and political borders. I wanted to make something where they could recontextualize soccer strategy as cultural strategy for marginalized youth. So this is my context for greeting you today. I am a working artist making opera, theater, and dance for proscenium and specific sites. And I'm an organizer who uses art for non-art outcomes. That's who the Kennedy Center hired in um, the position that used to be the vice president of community engagement. We'll talk about that later. Um, and that's who was leading the efforts to programmatically respond when George Floyd was killed in May of 2020. Like every organization in America, the Kennedy Center made a statement of solidarity in the first week of June 2020. But working across the institution, I was able to lead my colleagues towards a plan of action by July of 2020, a plan that built on the legacy that we'd been building over decades. Here's what the announcement of that plan looked like when we first shared it on social media in July of 2020. My name is Mark Bamuti Joseph. I'm an artist, a father, and for the last two years, I've been the vice president and artistic director of social impact here at the Kennedy Center. I am of the privileged and the hunted. I work with the belief that if racism is structural, then anti-racism also must be structural. That's why we're announcing a system that we're committed to growing over the next three to five years. We're going to be investing more than a million dollars annually in the local creative economy. We're showcasing artists from all 50 states. We're going to activate the reach with a lens on public health. We're connecting Black art to anti-racist organizing through our Black Culture Matters initiative. We're commissioning young composers of color in the classical music realm, focusing on cultural leadership and community action. We're working to produce symbols that inspire while cultivating systems that sustain an equitable future. So there's some key pieces of vocabulary to extract uh, from that moment. This idea of system, 
more than symbol. This idea of being privileged and hunted. Um, this idea of an arc of three to five years in terms of um, financial commitment and programmatic focus. What I want to share with you today is what we did after that statement and why the coexisting realities of being privileged and hunted, why the experience of privilege and vulnerability shapes what I think is the way to attack the question of equity in the classical music business. And to do this work, we have to question our institutional aesthetics. My mentor, uh, the great Liz Lerman, says that aesthetics are what a people believe to be good, beautiful, and true. So before we go any further, I would like to ask you to ask yourself, who are your people? And maybe answer that question for um, yourself or on behalf of your organization. Who are your people? What do your people believe? What do your people believe to be good, to be beautiful? What do your people believe to be true? Classical music is a genre whose aesthetics are duly concerned with a centuries old canon. My aesthetics are duly concerned with a centuries old canon as well. And the ethos of beauty and overcome is present throughout it. When we, the assembled body of artists and administrators that steward classical music in this country, when we are talking about um, community, who are we talking about when we use the phrase, the community? What did we say to them and to ourselves a year ago? When the doors of the concert hall were shut over the last year, what did we imagine could be true. If we're an industry whose aesthetics force us to constantly look back for beauty, how do we move our industry socially forward? Well, among my 39 jobs, I host a podcast with Paula Prestini, the co-founder and artistic director of National Sawdust, and Camila Forbes, the executive producer of the Apollo Theater. The podcast is called Active Hope, and it's so named because that's where all our creative conversations kept landing. Hope. All of us parents, all of us in our 40s, all of us within one generation of our families immigrating to the United States, all of us practicing artists, all of us leading really different arts institutions, all of us actively stuck on hope. I am in my artist body. I am a citizen. My job is social impact. I don't have time to not be hopeful. So how does a hopeful person frame an equitable future? Well, I have a podcast, so I interviewed a futurist. Uh, what you're about to see is an excerpt from uh, the most recent episode of Active Hope. Uh, you'll hear from Marina Gorbis, the executive director of the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto. Can you, can you just talk maybe a little bit about how you define variations in, um, in, in futures or in future perspectives? Yeah. There are many different approaches to thinking about the future. You know, scenarios is one of the methodologies we use. And particular methodology we use is called alternative futures methodology that actually comes from um, Dr. Dater, who was a, who is a futurist and was teaching at Hawaii, University of Hawaii at Manoa. And he uh, posited, and we believe in that, that, you know, when you think about all these visions of the future, there are four sort of archetypal ways in which we think about the future and construct scenarios in our minds. Mm -hmm. One is 
what we call growth, which is growth, which is basically continuation of things as they've always been. It doesn't necessarily mean growth, but it means like we're going to continue on the same path. And that's the easiest thing to envision. It's what we all think about, you know, every day that things will pretty much continue as they've been. The other sort of archetypal scenario is collapse. So something is really falling apart. Something is breaking. It could be a system or a subsystem. Now mm -hmm. we're talking about climate collapse and things like that. So interesting enough, a lot of people love envisioning collapse <laughs> because mm -hmm. things are complex. We live in a mm -hmm. very complex world and mm -hmm. it's hard to change. So why don't we just start anew? We just right. destroy what's there and build something new. Uh, the other one is constraint. So you're operating under the environment of some form of constraint. So now we're talking about resource constraint, like water shortages and things mm -hmm. like that, where you need to constrain your behaviors. There's a limitation. And, and my favorite one, and really the one that's the hardest for people to think about is transformation, where we're really moving into something very, very different. We're not destroying it, but we're transforming into something new. And, and that's the hardest one for people to envision, Mostly because when people think about the future, what's difficult about it is that they base it on their own personal experience. Mm -hmm. And let's take a lifespan, you know, at most 100 years about, right? And so mm -hmm. we kind of come to believe that everything that we do and how we behave and how things work is kind of, that's the only way to be in the world. Right. Like mm. it's almost like preordained. It's this is what it is. You know, we go to work from nine to five. We take vacations for a month. You know, we do this. The school call is followed by maybe college, by work and all of right. these things. So we, we think in this sets that are very sort of deterministic in some way. And when you think about transformation, you really have to put yourself into some very other space. And that's why mm -hmm. artists are so important. I always say that artists are futurists, just inherently futurists, because artists are able to envision something that we have not experienced, that may not exist, or they have to reformulate it in a very substantial way. Let's take the question of community and spin it around a little bit. Think of these versions of the future and imagine ourselves at our most optimized. Are we constrained? At our most optimized, are we collapsing? Are we growing? At our most optimized, are we transformative? What does a culturally transformative organization think about diversity, equity, and inclusion? What does it mean to presently invest in a transformational cultural future? What's the relationship between present solvency and social justice? DEI work has become a game of numbers and shame. Many of us are working on diversity of staff and canon. And I think many of us get that to be inclusive means that we're conscious of welcoming disparate cultures and cultural literacies with an aim towards tolerance, balance, and safety. Equity. Equity is a little more elusive. What I like to say is that equity doesn't mean everybody's in the house. Equity is what you have when you own your house. If we're serious about DEI work, our North Star has to be equity, which means we invest in creating shared stakes with historically marginalized communities, creating more than symbolic reasons to connect. We are creating symbiosis. In the last two years, I've helped to guide the Kennedy Center in a transition from a community engagement paradigm to a social impact framework. Engagement work builds diversity by making place for underrepresented communities. 
social impact builds on this work to also make cultural equity and creative home for those same communities. Social impact cannot work through disparate programs. Impact requires intention, humility, discipline, fiscal accountability, a compelling narrative, and organizational coherence. We don't want to be an institution that itinerantly responds to tragedy. We want to be a cultural center actively and consistently walking on a pathway forward. Now, I should note that I have all these highfalutin ideas, but I have to make them make sense at the Kennedy Center, okay? Which is freaking hard because the Kennedy Center has an adjacency to the federal government as a living memorial to the 35th president. So I have to advocate for doing this work in a way that is fiscally appropriate and diplomatically sound. By necessity, I have to take an approach to leadership that is centered in the capital of creativity and in the marketplace of American ideals. Artistic disruption, disruption in the context of federal bureaucracy co-joined practices funneled through the lever of a $250 million arts business federally tied to some version of the American social contract. Art is oxygen for the lungs of the body politic and the Kennedy Center is rare air. Our job is to remember that some of us can't breathe. Symbols and gestures are cool, but if we use the term structural racism, then anti-racism also must be structural. Symbols and gestures are cool, but if we use the term systemic racism, then we must also be systemically anti-racist. I actually don't think our country can be systemically anti-racist because of the inextricable relationship of race to labor and to wealth. But I do think that it is possible for schools and government and cultural places like the Kennedy Center to aspire to a position of systemic allyship or systemic solidarity. And in order to get there, I have started to ask myself different questions. In instead of asking, how can I be anti-racist? I ask, is it possible to choreograph social justice? I've been asking how we break this cycle where some horrific injustice happens and we're shocked and confused and we have this emotional response and then perform allyship until we get tired or feel guilty because we're not moving fast enough, which leads to inaction and passivity and eventually apathy until another horrific injustice happens. How do we cultivate an alternative cycle so that when a horrific injustice takes place, we're not overtaken by shock and confusion as if the fruit of systemic oppression is surprising? Instead, our emotional response is marked by empathy and compassion, which leads to a rejection of performative allyship in exchange for the real vigorous work. And if guilt and fatigue should try to settle in, we recenter those yearning for justice, remembering that inaction and passivity are detrimental to justice and that apathy is the antithesis of unconditional love. Let's say that an image that we all hold in our heads, that image of that man walking through the Capitol on January 6th with a Confederate flag, let's say that that is symbolically or overtly racist. Let's say Nancy Pelosi and them kneeling with their kente cloth in the Capitol uh, after George Floyd was killed. Let's say that's a demonstration or act of symbolic or overt anti-racism. Let's say we wanna go deeper and say there's a pyramid of behaviors that we can name as manifestations of white supremacy. What is the pyramid of behaviors that we can name as practices and manifestations of systemic solidarity? As we're in our practice as administrators, as educators, and as artists, how do we shape careers and institutions that are a reflection of a desire to support the world's greatest art while also making the world a better place. Well, I try to use this pyramid to think about gestures 
of white supremacy and the mountain of behaviors that um, are more covert, but just as damaging. And I try to flip that on its head. I say, if these are gestures of white supremacy, but we're seeking to be um, uh, systemically uh, counter to that, then we also have to build a system that, uh, that makes sense. It begins with a pipeline a pipeline of folks that hold us ethically and financially responsible. From that pipeline um, emerges a pedagogy, a modality, a structure, an organizational culture, um, a theory of change. So we're not building programs that respond to the moment. We are building a pedagogy out of which our programs emanate, our repertoire, our canon, our education. And if we do those things right, if we have um, a community of folks that's holding us responsible, if we have um, a social vision that's tied to a theory of change and a replicable practice of facilitating and performance, then our programs earn us a profile of community trust, of systemic allyship. All this work has led to the cartography project. How do we map trauma so as to heal from it? If music or sculpture represent a commitment to cultural memory, exactly what are we choosing to remember? And perhaps more poignantly, what are we choosing to forget? The Cartography Project is an attempt by the National Symphony Orchestra and the Washington National Opera to intentionally expand the radius of their own cultural memories. It's a curatorial project that evolves beyond the paradigm of equity as a numbers game and embraces a more sophisticated and compassionate practice of equity as a function of solidarity. It surfaces the talent of diverse backgrounds while also challenging both organizations and audiences to engage new sources of inspiration and discourse as we collaboratively bring classical music into the American future. The premise of the cartography project begins with a desire to acknowledge trespass or trauma and a further desire to heal from it. We began our journey by thinking about extrajudicial violence. We drew a map of these incidents, focusing on geographical variation. We committed to commissioning nine creative teams of composers and librettists who are under 45 years of age from those geographical locations who also come from historically marginalized or underrepresented communities. We initiated a new pipeline of composers into mainstream presentational space, and we were inspired to work with other organizations across geography to identify composers from across the country who work within the classical realm, but are also highly informed by the social contract. Pivotally, the cartography project doesn't ask composers or audiences to stay in the place of trauma. It asks of all parties, what is our collective role in recovering from struggle? What is the specific role of music in initiating conversations of healing? Can we curate support systems as well as curate musical programs? And because we were asking all those questions, we were further moved to do a little bit better than Black trauma. We kept the composers, but we changed the prompt. The cartography project now takes Black dignity as its central tenet and point of creative departure. While the murder of George Floyd compelled millions of people to protest uh, the reality of race-based extrajudicial violence, there remains another side of the coin that is as important and germane to our cultural discourse. Beyond memorializing the trauma of death, we seek to honor the enduring occasion of a dignified life. The Cartography Project asks its creative teams to consider the timeline of seven individuals before their chaotic and tragic demise. We afford to those same individuals the dignity of considering them as daughters, fathers, voters, coaches, healthcare workers, and musicians. The aspects of their lives that made them human and were ignored by assailants who could only read them as tropes and not beings. 
through musical composition and poetry, the NSO and the WNO reposition the conversation about the matter of Black life and descend our gaze down from the macro horizon to focus on the intimacy and simplicity of the matter of Black dignity. It is a basic, humane, and yet elusive request that we make through music. Map the humanity of those who are gone too soon through soaring tone and dignified embrace. What if dignity were currency? And our business model depended on spinning the capital of dignity into the capital of finance. What if when we said equity, we didn't mean everybody's in the house, we meant equity. Like what you got if you own your house, invested in inclusion to produce equity for diverse communities, which means more than putting on shows or producing symbols. The matter of Black life sure is controversial, but surely Black dignity couldn't possibly be cause for alarm. What if all this Disease was a prompt for an entrepreneurial reframe, like the explosion of crypto as currency. What if we treated the art of cultivating dignity as an intentional economy? If the product were empathy and you had to make it and you had to make it mass accessible, what raw materials would you use? What if dignity were currency and the raw material to make it was culture? What if you worked at a cultural mint and printed white walls and bright lights and the aesthetic sublime 80% of the time, but 20% of every dime was spent minting cultural equity for the historically left behind? Equity, not like proportional balance, equity like profit on your p and l balance who in this country is manufacturing empathy just a little bit and in the end wouldn't we all benefit what if dignity were medicine were a vaccine and the public and private sector teamed up to invest in our collective healing and our country's cultural mints were the place where anybody could get pricked with the sharp edge of culture, a chemical boost included us all because we've learned that if I'm healthy and you're sick, I'm at risk. Why risk emerging from this moment in a culturally unhealthy way? Why put a cultural inflection point to waste? What if the product were collective healing and in order to do it, we had to produce more cooperative economics, except no one would buy it if it wasn't fly. So we had to invest in artists, invested in their individual projects, but use artists' intellect to mass produce dignity and put as much equity in it as you would a non-fungible token of a digital object. We make value. Diversity is not a stock to be left alone to accrue. Diversity is a paper thin bill you gotta keep stacking or else you're not serious. What if you were making a city? How many great artists does it take to make a great city? How many artists does it take to make America great? If you had Equity stakes in empathy, who would you invest in first? In the ecosystem of cultural production, what if we all win? If we all win, what if we didn't all have to win? We just all remembered when the world was sick mm. and collective healing was something we were all invested in. What if nobody got left behind? What if we healed forward, cardinal directions, truth, dimension, humanity, access, latitudes of public imagination, longitudinal public policy, X, Y, Z, access, access the ancestors, all their names, map the future, collective dignity, the moral compass, invest in the road forward, culture as brick, walk the walk. Uh -huh. I, I haven't lived in the nation's capital for long, but I am no stranger to art and ritual. On the night of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's transition, I got on my bicycle and I pedaled down to the Supreme Court, 
listening to her favorite opera, Marriage of Figaro, on the way. That night, the monument was a magnet drawing hopeful Americans together in grief and trepidation. A woman had passed, and it felt that maybe with her, the endurance of equitable law had passed as well. The monument was thus activated in its imbued symbolic power. If the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice, as Dr. King opined, then the Supreme Court is the American site where that moral arc comes to be codified. Borrowing from Mozart and Motown, I'm not exactly sure if Justice Ginsburg would have dug the operas that I make, but I'm pretty sure she would have appreciated the spirit of my newest one, It All Falls Down, which is a commission from the Washington National Opera. It's an American story, a Black Love Matters sermon, a coming out narrative in defense of a future norm. It's an opera living between the guardian of law and the contemplation of justice, where in the end, love overrules. In the opera, I quote from the Supreme Court's landmark decision on marriage equality. Justice Kennedy wrote, the nature of injustice is that we may not always see it in our own times. The generations that wrote and ratified the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment did not presume to know the extent of freedom in all of its dimensions. And so they entrusted to future generations a charter prote protecting the right of all persons to enjoy liberty as we learn its meaning. I'm so moved by those words. I'm so moved. They didn't know, they didn't presume to know the extent of freedom in all its dimensions. So they entrusted to future generations, a charter protecting the right of all persons to enjoy liberty as we learn its meaning. League of American Orchestras, family, let's be the future. Let's continue to learn liberty and protect the right of all persons to enjoy it. Let's be culturally transformative, committed to freedom in all its dimensions. I thank you so much for your time. Um, we have about 20 minutes left and I'd love to be in conversation with you and with Laura and our remaining time. Thank you so much for listening. Wow, that thank you so much, Bamuti. And please let's show some love in the chat because that was just so incredible. And um, you know, we're going to continue this conversation now. So if you have questions, thoughts, things you'd like to add to this conversation, please include it in the chat. There's also a Q and A, um, which the moderators can see, but not necessarily everyone else. So please add that there. And yes. Uh, I hope you're seeing all this love because it is, uh, I think everyone is feeling this right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can I, can I do a shameless plug? Please, please. Is that okay? I feel a little weird about it. Do it. Okay, cool. <laughs> so if, if any of that made any sense to y'all, if, if that felt, if, if that felt worthwhile, I, I just want to share that I'm um, hosting a, a three day uh, virtual retreat. Um, next week. Um, it's called uh, Healing Forward. Um, you can go to healforward.org. Um, a, a lot of the ideas that I, I shared just now are, um, we, we really dig into them. We really dig into this idea, particularly of pipeline pedagogy, um, program and profile. Um, as it says, we're, um, we're we're here to bolster organizations as as we move forward and um a, a lot of the spirit a lot of the energy um a lot of the ideas get fleshed out in community um folks from all over the country have registered thus far um large organizations like bam or the 
the Lucas Museum of, of Narrative are present, smaller organizations, university presenters, university professors, media organizations, youth literacy organizations. It's a really great group of people that have registered um, thus far, dozens and dozens of folks. Um, and I would love for you to, to join us too, if any of that um, that you just saw made any kind of sense and you're curious about taking your organization further. So that's my commercial. Well, thanks for sharing that. I can already tell that there are some people. I think you're going to get some extra registrants today. Because, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you've shared so much in in this keynote. And I think that there's just uh, there's a lot to unpack. And there are some things that, um, you know, I, I, I imagine that there are maybe some questions from folks about, you know, how do you even how where do you start? Like, how do you even begin to really kind of move this conversation forward because I think so much of what you're, what you're talking about and some of the things you said about how so often we see people by their circumstance or the stereotype or what's happening right in that moment, but we don't see beyond that and see the person and find that empathy and the humanity. So tell us a little bit more about how, how we dig into that as you know, maybe as an individual, but then also in leading that change in thinking in our in our organizations. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I try to frame um, ethics in economic terms. I, I I tried intentionally to talk about being a culturally transformative organization because the truth is is that if we're not better to one another, we're all going to collapse that we can proceed as we um, have been doing, and that's um, worthwhile, I think, but um, there's, um, there's a, a trajectory shift that I think is afoot that also corresponds to the sustainability of our organizations. So I think most of us have a great moral center and moral core. Um, I think most of us, um, have been confronted with a kind of segregation of that extraordinary moral core from from the thinking about our um, financial st um, stability, this relationship between, like I said, present solvency and and social justice. So I, I think one of the ways that we do this work is just to think about it in terms of tying our organizational growth to the cultural growth and stability of historically marginalized communities um, in, our, uh, in our midst, in our region. Um, there, there are several questions that we'll, we'll be asking during, uh, during the retreat um, next week that are about tying our fortunes to the fortunes of folks that um, have been historically segregated from our program and our, um, and our institution. So, um, you know, as far as like, how do we individually do it? Uh, I'm not a rabbi. I don't even play one on TV. But <laughs> I, I can't tell you exactly how you get um, there personally. Um, you know, being in the body that I'm in, having children that look like I do. I have a particular stake in a cultural future in part because a lot of my cultural past is marked by historical trauma. So I don't want to go back necessarily. I have to move forward. And a, a question for our organizations is, what is the cost of not moving forward? Hmm. Um, you know, and, and to whom? It goes back to like, who are our people? And you know, just building on that, some of the questions that are coming in in the Q&A are really centered around that idea of taking this idea of equity or empathy as equity and this reframing of the conversation around uh, racial equity, social justice and, um, you know, DEI. How do you take these big ideas that you've shared and turn that into action? Um, you know, because I think that's where so many of us struggle is, you know, we can talk 
all day long. But then, you know, I think what's been incredible and remarkable about the work that you've shared is that there's action. There is, um, you know, something moving forward. Tell us more about that. Um, well, I believe, um, first of all, I think I saw Susan Fetter, um, uh, present, um, I, you know, the Mellon Foundation has been incredible in supporting us. There are tons and tons of folks that have supported um, this work, individual donors, um, corporations, foundations like this. So, you know, I, I think it's important to say that um, there's a world of um, folks in philanthropy that believe in this work and support this work. I think it's important to say, and I and I hate to be so crass um, about the bottom line, but I do believe that budgets are moral documents. So um, a lot of us are like, how do I do it? Well, um, what would happen if you did one less concert? Um, what What are the financial stakes of expanding the programmatic radius so that you can just go ahead and do it? Um, I, I think a lot of us say, I don't know, I don't know how. Well, I, I would say that the first step is um, again the pipeline. Who is holding you ethically responsible? Who is holding you financially responsible? The second thing I would say is, as of June um, 2020, there's like a billion dollars, a billion new dollars in in the economy from corporations ranging from Sony to, you know, to Air Jordan, where folks are like, I got $50 million over five years for organizations that are um, working on social justice and equity. So there is money available to do this work if you have a plan, which is the second thing. Have a plan. What is your five-year plan? plan, not just like your five-year um, strategic plan, but is your does your organization's current five-year plan include projections about the socioeconomic and cultural equity growth of historically marginalized communities in your region? Mm -hmm. And if you have a plan that, um, that ties um, uh, your organizational growth to your region's cultural growth, then you have what I call a social vision. Now you have, you develop a program that's in service of a social vision. And you define it according to what works for your organization. Then it's a matter of political will. And this is where, and thank you, Simon, for, for highlighting the idea of a budget as a moral document. Um, you have five dollars. What are you? What are you spending on social justice? Yeah. Like um, ten cents, because that's what you'll get on your return. You know, a quarter, because that's what you'll get as as your return. And and the reason why I think it's important to have like a five year plan is because you don't have to spend millions of dollars today. You can plan to spend, um, you know, an appropriate amount of resources over the course of five years. This is why this session is called the arc of systemic hmm. solidarity, because as much as I've tried, I've never written the poem that like undid patriarchy. I've never like made a dance, you know what I mean? And then white supremacy was over, heterosexism was over. Like that doesn't happen. So it's not going to happen in a concert. Right. But this is why we live in the culturally transformative future. We build towards that. We budget accordingly. We hire accordingly like this. That's a beautiful arc. And just to kind of recap what you just said, it's, it's, that budget is a moral compass, having that five-year plan that is based around your social vision and having the political will to move it forward and get that return on investment that you're making in those other areas. That's really incredible roadmap for us to take action around these ideas that you've shared. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think one of the other things that you shared 
in in today's talk that's just i think so powerful is this vision of american orchestras being part of the construction of the yes. american future yes tell us more about like let's dig into that because that is just one of the most powerful ideas i think as we you know, again, kind of reframe this idea of what it means to be in relationship to our communities. I think what the thesis you're sharing is so much more powerful than that. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I, I have uh, kids who um, go, you know, when they were in elementary school um, during February, we had um, like a African-American history night at their school. And I remember sitting in their audience, my kids now are, are 19 and 16, but I, I, I remember sitting in the audience and my daughter's class performed a Bob Marley song as part of this like black history event. And I was like, how was Bob Marley history? Hmm. Because I wasn't about like, I don't think of Bob Marley as like a historical figure, but there I was sitting in like 2010. I was like, oh yeah, he's kind of been gone for a minute. Hmm. I think I, I used to think of history as like black and white material, um, speeches by Dr. King or um, images of Eleanor Roosevelt. But um, history is not finite and fixed. We make history. Similarly, the future doesn't have to happen to us. We make the future. So in my institutional work, in my administrative work, um, and I, I mentioned this very briefly, um, I, I changed my way of thinking um, in terms of, um, instead of like curating, I thought of this as like, I thought of this work as cultural design. Hmm. So the example that I like to give is um, this country has a great system for deporting people. This country has a great system for um, a great design for incarcerating people. So can we design freedom? And what is the role of the arts institution or of the orchestra in terms of designing the future? It, this means uh, a complete rejection of what the New York Times used to call art and leisure. Our work is not just for leisure. It is part of the fabric of a social design. And we who are marketers, who work in development, our conductors, our musicians, our executive directors, we have the power to design the future. This is part of what I mean by, does your organization have a pedagogy? Are you committed to a, a kind of um, theory of change? And can you state it? Can the musicians in your orchestra, besides being you know, world-class and extraordinary, can the musicians in your orchestra also state as part of their onboarding what your organizational theory of change is? So this is just about accountability. That um, we, we don't have to be passive. We provide a great service to the world in being excellent at the aesthetic sublime. We do. Um, but as Marina Gorbis says, where else is transformation going to come from if it's not from art and artists? My best friend graduated um, from a school in, in Louisville uh, this past weekend. And because I fly all the friggin' time, I have mad frequent flyer miles, which, as many of you know, you know, sometimes that means you get upgraded. So I got upgraded to first class and um, I got upgraded to seat 2A. The person who was sitting in seat 3A was the Republican minority leader, Mitch McConnell, who, you know, is the senator from Kentucky. So it made total sense that he was on a flight from Louisville to D.C. I'm not looking for a transformational future for Mitch McConnell. 
I'm not looking for a transformational future from our elected officials. I am looking for a transformational future from our artists. And those of you who steward art in America, it's your friggin' job, yo. It's part of the gig. Well, I don't think that there's any other way to just express what your challenge is to all of us as leaders of American orchestras. Uh, you know, it's that stewardship of American art, of creating the future of our country. Um, any last last words or advice or challenges or actions that you wish for us as leaders of American orchestras to take forward uh, into the future? I, I would just say, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Simon, for inviting me. Thank you, everybody, for listening, for paying attention. Um, please register for um, for the retreat. I think it's good stuff. Um, the, the core message maybe that I would leave you with today is let's not go back to normal. Let's not go back. Let's start again. Let's start again, but let's not go back. Thank you so much, Bamuti. Thank you everyone that's here today for this conversation and participating. Uh, let's just give one last big collective chat round of applause <laughs> for all of this. Yes, thank you. Um, before we break, I have just a few more announcements to share just to let you know about what's coming up next for today. A uh, quick reminder, there is an evaluation that's in Boomset. Please fill that out to let us know, you know your feedback about today's session uh, and the conversation. At 2.15 p.m. Eastern time, uh, you'll have the opportunity to listen in on a panel conversation called Survive to Thrive, Why Community is Central to Our Collective Success. And the speakers in that will be uh, Maria Rahu from the San Diego Symphony, Osa Armstrong from the National Repertory Orchestra, Michael Frisco from the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, Brianna Scales from the Florida Symphony Youth Orchestras, and Jan Jana walters Gitzeg from the Pioneer Valley symphony. Um, I look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all the league staff that supported this. And thank you again to Mark Bamudi Joseph. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Take care.